You know, there's so many ways that we can go as we examine understanding the kingdom. And we're on part 40 of this, and I was kind of looking over the Biblical Life Assembly website trying to figure out what I need to change and update, and man, there's a lot. But we have been teaching on this since 2015. And so we've been on it for a while. And uh, there's a lot of things I want to get to. I had some people email me because they were concerned because I, in a sense, downplayed tongues. It wasn't that I was downplaying tongues and that we've had too many people seek tongues and not seek the rest of the baptism. And unlike some that we can point to, like Lester Summerall and Smith Wigglesworth and many others, that God has done exceptional things, we have a lot of powerless tongue talkers. And it was trying to emphasize that we need to go deeper in God. And the Word says that we go from faith to faith to glory to glory. No matter how deep you think you've gotten in God, there are new levels that we need to go. And that's kind of part of what I want to get into today. I want to start in John chapter 12, starting in verse 20. And I have a lot of concerns. I have a lot of concerns as I see what's going on in the church, I have a lot of concern what I see going on by people that uh, claim to be a remnant or no longer in the church, that you see them on social media. Now, there's a lot of great people that we, Mary and I talk to all the time, and we hear from, and I, I don't want to underemphasize that. We have some awesome, awesome folks literally around the world uh, that we hear from, that help support us, uh, that, that help with many things that we're doing. But at the same time, there are many of us, and then I kind of reflect when Josh Peck was ministering at uh, Hear the Watchman in Dallas, he actually waxed pastoral when I was expecting him to deal with maybe some type of physics and how it lines up with the Word, and he was calling it Christian cannibalism because we have Christians devouring one another on social media. That's a disgrace, and it's actually the opposite of the way things should be if we're going to show the world Jesus. Now in John chapter 12, this is during the feast, and it says, And there were certain Greeks among them that came up, at, uh, come up to worship at the feast. And the same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, sir, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. You need to underline that in your Bible, sir we would see Jesus. Now, how many know that Jesus has ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father? But it's through His body that now the world sees who Jesus is. And they're not getting a very clear picture. And what I'm, I'm beginning to, uh, what I want to deal with is that we need to, we need to represent the whole king. We need to represent, uh, there's, there's five areas that I want to get into, and this is going to be just an introduction this morning. But you see, part of the being the end time remnant is, is not being what, you know, some people could, would call rapture ready. Now, I'm living for Jesus, and when he says, yo, I'm going to go, regardless of the timing of it. But how many know that we have a harvest to bring into the kingdom before he comes back? And we cannot do it in the flesh. It's almost to this generation when the Apostle Paul was dealing with, with uh, the, the erroneous teaching of salvation through circumcision. He said, that which you have begun in the spirit, can it be finished in the flesh? And the truth is, no, it cannot. We cannot win a world to Christ in the flesh. Because what you're doing is you're resonating with the world and you're not resonating with the kingdom of God. And so the Lord has got to do a work on us. We've got to do a work on us. Because through the remnant, the world and even much of the church has got to see Jesus and to see Him glorified to see His character, to see His power, to see His kingdom. That is what will wake up sleeping saints, and that is what will cause the world, the Greeks, if you will, to say, 
we would see Jesus. We would desire to have, to have him in our lives. If, we, if, if our Christianity is so poor that we couldn't offer it to another, there's something wrong. We're supposed to be salt and light in the earth. And there's five areas that we have, we have got to deal with, that we have got to work with, to, to have the, the whole Christ, to represent Jesus, to represent Messiah in the earth. And everybody says, oh great, he's going to teach on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but that's not number one. Right now we need something more than the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And all the charismatics said, what? We have to have his character. We have to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons that this is so important, when you look at the, at the hem of the high priest's garment, God wanted that high priest to give a true sound when he moved. And so there wasn't just bells around his hymn, but there were pomegranates too that brought balance to the gifts. And if there was an ever a time in church history that the gifts are out of balance, it is today because you can't move in his power if you're not established in his character. The second is we have to have his heart, which are the motivational gifts. Third, we have to have his ministry to prepare the body, which is the fivefold ministry. Fourth, we have to have the expression of his kingdom, which are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And fifth, we have to have the authority of the kingdom, and that's the believer under authority and moving in authority. Without those five, we cannot represent a true picture of Christ in the earth. And if you notice, there are five of them, and five is the number of grace, because all of this is a manifestation of the grace of Messiah to an earth that has, Satan literally has this planet with his foot across their neck, ready to dominate it and destroy it if he has half a chance. And the only thing that is balancing that out is the church of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to give a quick introduction to the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In times past years ago, when I taught on the fruit of the Holy Spirit for Biblical Life College and Seminary, I spent 18 weeks introducing it. Because there's a lot in there that we have to have. But I want to start tonight, and, or today, and what I want to look at is there are two places in the Word of God where fruit of the Spirit are mentioned. The first one is Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 26. I'll let you find that in your Bibles. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. How many know that you can walk in all those? Not only do you not violate the commandments, but it actually helps you keep the commandments. But notice verse 24 here. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the, with the affections and lusts. If, I, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, prior to this, he lists the works of the flesh, which we'll get to just, just in a minute. But there is a contrast going on in the example of the Apostle Paul. This is the way paganism in the world lives. This is the way that you move in the kingdom. See the difference. And he's basically sharing the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5. Is the only other place that the Apostle Paul references the fruit of the Spirit. In Ephesians 5, 8 through 11. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. May I say that goodness, righteousness, and truth are the fertilizers that help cultivate the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay? But he doesn't stop there. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. 
Now he's contrasting the works of darkness to the works of light. And only when you begin walking in the fruit of the Holy Spirit can you begin manifesting the works of light and prove to people to show, to demonstrate to them what is acceptable unto the Lord. Ouch. But he doesn't stop there. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So when we begin living the way that we're supposed to live by walking in the Spirit and having the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're not only manifesting that which, is, uh, that which the Lord approves, the lifestyle in which the Lord approves, we begin exposing darkness for the heinous acts that it is. It's the church being salt and light in an earth that is rancid and full of darkness. And I believe that one of the reasons that we are facing some of the things that we're facing today in America and in the earth is we got, we got all caught up with building big numbers, building mega churches, or building this, building that, whatever it may be, and we forgot about the kingdom and we forgot what we were supposed to be. Because you can build something big if you keep people happy. You start, and what a lot of pastors have found out is if you really start teaching truth and teaching it hard, the herd runs. They will run for the back door. And they will find somebody that pets them on the head and tells them that their sin is okay. A, a true pastor will pet their head and say, that sin that's bothering you, you need to take it. You need to crucify it up there on that cross. It needs to die so that you can live. That's the true job of a pastor. That's the true job of an apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. It doesn't matter. It belongs there. But in our current place in history, we have, we have put an overemphasis on the gifts and we have totally lost our emphasis on the fruit. And what we have not realized is first, the, the, the gifts of the, of the fruit of the Holy Spirit balance out the gifts and brings homeostasis. It brings this, this balance that, that God has placed. But when you begin losing the character of Christ, God turns down the power on the gifts. There, there are times that you can look in, in church history. I mean, when you look at Smith Wigglesworth, Lester Summerall, um, Howard Carter is the one who, who had basically rediscovered and began teaching the body of the gifts again. Lester Summerall moved underneath him and, and learned his ministry from him. And Howard Carter so moved in the gifts that he said, you raised the money, I'm going to Australia. He didn't know where he was going to be in Australia. It took him like six or eight months to get the money and the passport and everything together. But the day that he arrived without any communications, there was a man standing on the dock waiting for Lester Summerall to get off the boat and said, Howard Carter told me that you were going to be on this boat, what you were going to be wearing, and he sent, here, sent me here to fetch you. That's the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating when there's a balance because Howard Carter had learned that you had to have the fruit to have the gifts. They got to be in balance. But in today, when I start viewing social media, heaven weeps. If I had a dollar, you see, one of the things I have learned with the KIB site, every single comment that goes up has to be approved by me personally. I don't let it, I, I, have, I have had people, when they look at our videos, and I, had, I, I just, I deleted a couple this week, one of them said, your introduction sucks. Why? Because it was around earth. Well, you show the fruit of it. I've had comments that, you know, your ministry would grow if you lose weight. Why are you thinking I'm eating all the money? Or, or this week I had one that I needed to have my teeth cleaned. Forget that I took medicine when I was a kid that darkened my teeth. I've come out of the dentist with my teeth just as stained as they were when I went in. Comment after comment, snipe after snipe, or I don't like this, or I don't like that. Who asked your opinion? If you have an opinion... You go start your own ministry and begin sharing your opinions, and then we'll find out what everybody else thinks about your opinion. Come on. 
I have a lot of brothers that I'm in fellowship with that I don't agree with everything that they, that their, their theological positions. You know what? We're still in fellowship and we don't sit there and, and sit down and have to share with each other our opinions about the things that we disagree with. We choose to agree on Jesus and on the part of the words that we agree on and to come together for the sake of the body and the rest of it will work itself out as we mature in the Lord. But we have had this generation. Guys, when I, when I look at the church... The church has become a circus. Now, what's funny is when you... I've got, a, I've got a, a book written back in the 1800s on the history of the King James English Bible. King James demanded that in the translation of the King James Bible, they had to use the word church rather than assembly. Yet, when you look at the English word church, it is derived from the Latin word that is the root for circus. How appropriate. And that is much of what the church has become today because the flesh will turn anything into a circus. But whenever God is moving, there is a grace about it that begins to show the character, the nature, and the majesty of Messiah himself. And that's what I'm looking for. And I think part of the, of the result is liberalism has so permeated society. I agree that I, I, think, I think that liberalism is a mental disease. But you know what? So do the elite. And the protocol of the learned elders of Zion, and it is not a Jewish document, it is a Sabbatine Kabbalist document. In fact, some instead of Zion, they say it should be Sion, like the Priory of Sion, which was a Masonic order but it all kind of blends back in together, says that they were going to use liberalism to weaken the nations. Now, how many can look at America right now and say that America has become weak because of liberalism? In fact, it has gotten to the place where it is ludicrous that we now have generations that have been raised on liberalism, that, that they're literally saying that if you have an opinion different than mine, that is hate speech, and I get traumatized, and now I must be carted off to a safe place where I am free from hearing your opinion, and I can be given crayons and Play-Doh adults, not kids, to calm myself down. Yet in America... The very democracy that we live under gives freedom of speech for all so that we can openly and honestly and with respect for one another debate different ideologies and different concepts within the freedom of who we are in America. But liberalism is stripping that away so that it can escort us into totalitarianism. And guys, this has infiltrated the church. Between that and the mind control programming at the subliminal level, and I've taught on this before with the TV, that it puts you into a suggestive modality, almost like hypnosis, and it begins manipulating your emotions. We are, I am hearing from pastors every month that are beside themselves because they, they're opening up the Word of God and saying, this is what God's Word says. And they have people that many times that are even on their boards that will say, I don't feel like God was right. Who cares? Here is a basic theology. You're wrong. God's right. Let God be true and every man, every board member, and every parishioner be a liar. When we get to heaven, God's not going to ask you what you feel about a thing. He's going to say, how did you stand up to my truth? Truth, in a sense, is emotionless. In other words, it's not manipulated by emotion. It's, you know, go to a mountain and yell at it. Tell that mountain that you're mad at it. Tell that mountain that it's invading your space. Tell that mountain that you don't like the way it casts its shadows. How does it affect the mountain? It doesn't, but anybody watching you realizes that you look like an idiot. 
That's the state of modern society today. And we're just under the opinion that if we have enough people gather together around that mountain and shout, that we're going to move that mountain, make that mountain something different. It doesn't work that way. God's mountain of truth is immovable. It is eternal. We, we have had a little, let me just touch just a minute on this because one of the things that I hear so much is, is this is a Jewish conspiracy. There, are, there were some people that were Jewish as far as a religion. The Sabbateans that rejected, they, the, the Sabbatean movement, he began to teach that redemption came through iniquity. He was an anti mosite And after he died, and there was all kinds of things, in fact, it amalgamated into a good portion of Islam. And after he died, about a, a century later, a guy rose up named Frank that was even worse than he was. And you follow the trail of Frank, and it leads right up to Adam Weishaupt. And the Rothschilds and the formation of the Illuminati. So the same movement that were anti mosites will one day produce the Antichrist. And in their philosophy, some of the things that they embedded is we're going to use this liberalism to weaken the nations. We are going to hit you with so many different opinions that it is impossible to ferret out the truth. In other words, the Illuminati are actually the creators of fake news. And they, and they planned this long before the First World War. That's how long that this document goes back. They were, they were speaking of things, waiting for the technology and the different things to get there. But listen to some of the things that have creeped into our politics and have creeped into the church. The end justifies the means. No, it doesn't. If you have got to be sinful, deceitful, and murderous to achieve something, you have planted, the, you have, you have planted to the wind the, world, the Word of God declares, you will reap the whirlwind. Anything worth doing must be done in honesty, in righteousness, and in truth. If you plant that, that's what you get. That's time. Anytime communism comes up in any nation, it not only ends up in a dictatorial uh, apparatus, it costs the lives of millions. We forget that Nazism was a form of socialism. The Soviet Union killed millions of their own people. North Korea has killed millions of its own people. China has killed millions of its own people. Several million because their, Mao came up with this idea of how to do farming. And it's, I think it was either 10 or 15 million people died of starvation before he decided he was wrong. That's the, and in, other, in other words, once, once you have politicians think something, they just throw more money at it and they'll let everybody starve to death except those that are making the policies. Doesn't that sound like today? But they say the end justifies the means. No, it doesn't. The second thing that this carnal way, this liberalism does things, it immediately attacks and displays absolute outrage with anything that disagrees with it. Do you know, I've had some people kicked off of YouTube because they literally cussed me out, spelling out the superlatives on their comments on YouTube that were so vile that before I, these were supposed to be Christians that had actually had their own. One guy lost his YouTube channel. Supposed to be a Christian dealing with stuff that was so prolific with his superlatives that before I had a chance to find the comment, 15 or 20 people reported him to YouTube. And not only he got kicked off of YouTube and lost his channel permanently. Now what glory did that bring to Jesus Christ? People are going to have different opinions than you. That's okay. It's not the end of the world. But the leftist tactic is to give this outrage, and this outrage has no logic to it. It has nothing to it. It's, it's, just, it's just the ends justify the means. What is that doing in the church? What's that doing on social media in the church? 
It does not display the character of Christ. Snipe attacks. We get those all the time. Constantly. I should show you guys some of the emails. I now have a longer list of people that my system automatically deletes than I do VIPs in my email system. I have hundreds that call me everything but a tall, fat man. <laughs> At least, you know, if you're going to insult me, you're so tall I can't stand it and you're bigger than a house. Yeah, I know, but I'm, God can still use me. But some of this other stuff, it's just absolutely crazy. And it's this argumentative spirit. Well, I'm an apologist. No, you're not. You're, you're an argumenter and you're, you're trying to use your flesh to do something for the kingdom and it's destroying the kingdom you're representing. It's a, a disgrace in the body of Christ. I have seen men that are apologists, that, that, that are real apologists, that can sit down in love and respect for one another and have an open discussion about things and there's love and there's respect and there's appreciation for all their ministries and even though at the very end they may not fully agree with each other they love each other they support each other and will shake each other's hands that's because the fruit of the spirit is there now all of these concepts i've mentioned they originate and they're empowered through the carnal flesh Something that our king demands that we crucify. You see, I, I want to see the, the power of the gifts of the Holy Spirit turned up. And as I look back and, and over, I've been, I've been a part of the charismatic movement since the late 70s. I'm showing my age. I got a lot of snow on the roof. And what I have seen, why the power has gone down, is because the character of Christ has been lost. And we can talk about the fire of God all day long. We can talk about the power of God all day long. We can talk how Lester Summerall and Howard Carter and, and Smith Wigglesworth used to move in it. We can talk about that all day long. But until holiness and the character of Christ is restored to the church, God is not going to allow the power switch to be opened up. That's one of the reasons in my book after next that I'm going to do on the armory of God is so many of us think that, you know, I have authority in Christ and you expect for that armory to open up and you to pull out a bazooka and the Holy Spirit hands you a squirt gun because that's all the power, that's all the character that you have to be able to handle. You're too childish. You don't give an M16 to somebody that can't handle a BB gun. And why can you handle, why can you hand, as, as a young man grows up, he can go from a squirt gun to a dart gun to a BB gun to a 22 to something bigger is when they develop the responsibility and the character to handle that kind of power. If it's that way in the natural, it has got to be that way in the spiritual as well. But what we have done Ministry through the crucifixion of the flesh and the fruit of the Holy Spirit will gravitate from the... If, if you do not crucify the flesh and you have all the gifts of the Holy Spirit moving and there's no Christ-likeness, it will gravitate from the gifts of the Holy Spirit to spiritism. It'll gravitate into occult practices wrapped in... In Christian veneer. Some of the things that I, that I have seen, unedited videos of some things that are going on in the charismatic movement, send chills up and down my spine, and they're not Holy Ghost goosebumps. There's, oh my God, that's being allowed and being called the Holy Ghost. You see, back in the 70s and 80s, in the heat of, of the charismatic movement where holiness was preached, those, those people wouldn't be going, oh, it's the Holy Spirit. Those people would have been casting demons out of the one manifesting it. We're getting closer and closer to seeing that which David Wilkerson had preached. In fact, somebody sent me an article the other day because one of the things he said is one day people are going, they're going to call worship dancing naked in church. That's being fulfilled today that there are, there are churches that are nudists going on. Now talk about not having modesty. It's a wonder that lightning doesn't strike the top of that church and have Ichabod written across the, the doorpost going in. 
We're seeing some of the things that the old guard warned us about. And we're going to sleep because it's not the power gifts that keep you awake spiritually. It's the character of Christ and the fire of God and holiness that keep you spiritually awake. And when you're there, and any time throughout history, and I've, I've got a, a great three-book series that, uh, that this individual has written on the history from the day of Pentecost to present of the move of the Holy Spirit with every generation. What preceded the power, listen to me, what preceded the power every single time was repentance, a return to holiness, and to seek the character of Christ within. When you sought those, the power always showed up. There were, and, and even in America, I think there, are, there is a double stream. There's, um, there, there, with, the, with the Azusa movement, they weren't seeking the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They were, see, they were humbling themselves, getting right with God, and God began to manifest in power. But yet there's another strain that goes, that goes up to uh, uh, Topeka, Kansas, that they were seeking just the gift of tongues. That's all, that's all they wanted. And the pastor was a mason. And so you end up having these two different streams. I want the one where it was the passion for the presence of God and holiness and seeking the face of Christ and wanting his character within and crucifying the flesh. That's the one that is true. And historically, I don't care if you're looking at Charles Finney's ministry. I don't care if you're looking at, at uh, um, Wesley's ministry or many others. What caused God to move was crucifying the flesh, repentance, getting right before God, and seeking the character of Christ on the inside. That's why if we're going to move in kingdom, why is God going to allow His kingdom to move through your carnality? He will refuse to do it. Not only will the armor not go on where the character of Christ is not, is not there, the gifts will not properly flow. And so we, in, in churches that, that believe in the gifts, we, we have a lot of Rondai Shondai going on and, and uh, we, we have people prophesying out of their own spirits and, and prophesying their carnal desires. You know, and I, I've taught this before when we, we deal with, with prophetic gifts. You know, and it ranges everywhere from, from the lady getting up and saying, Singeth me those old songs, saith the Lord. Well, if they're old songs to the Lord, how old are they? Well beyond the hymnal, don't you think? The Lord does not like the Hosanna songs, even though they're taken out of his, his hymnal that David wrote. How I many know that those are older than what Wesley wrote? But no, this saith the Lord, singeth to me those old songs. And you end up with a woman getting up prophesying, these Lord, these, these are scary days, saith the Lord. These are hard times, saith the Lord. These days even scareth me, saith the Lord. If you have days that scareth the Lord, thou art in trouble. It's prophesying out of your own spirit. Now contrast that to a story I pulled from Lester Sumrall when he was teaching on the gifts, that there was a little country church and there were these, these uh, teenagers that were prone to trouble and they were drinking and taking drugs and stuff and they ran out of money. And this one girl had been raised in church and she said, well, we'll go down to that church and we'll get up and I'll do my little show and uh, we'll get them to take us up an offering. When we get the offering, we can go have drinking money. And so they get up there and they're talking about how they're doing this for the Lord and that for the Lord. And they give a little prophecy. And this old lady stands up in the back and says, Thus saith the Lord, you are an abomination. How dare you come into my house that you're a harlot and that you're a drunkard and that you take drugs and you're trying to take my holy money from my people for your carnal ways. I judge you this day. How many know that that kind of cleared the altar? Now, which one's which? You see, in Azusa, when God was moving, people walked in eggshells before the Holy Ghost. The character of Christ is there. But let's compare that to what's going on here in the church. Let's go to, to Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and through 21. And I think what's going on in America is a reflection of what's going on in a lot of the church. In fact, a lot of what is called the church, I refuse to call the church. It's the assembly, the gahal in Hebrew, or the ecclesia 
in Greek means those called out of Babylon. Like Abraham. I've been called out of the world and assembled together to be a part of God's holy people. Okay? Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. But the works of the flesh are manifested, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revilings, and such like. Now I want you to pay attention to this next phrase here. Of which I have told you before, as I have also told you in past time, that they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Underline that in your Bible. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now we're going to eventually in this study, I'm going to take apart every one of those word by word. And I'm also going to take apart the fruit of the Spirit word by word. But... Just like with the fruit of the Spirit, there's only two places in the Bible that said, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So the first one's this one. If this is going on, you ain't kingdom. You can talk about kingdom all day long. You are not kingdom. The other one, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 or 9 through 11. Now, actually, Joe chose this to hit one stone. There's two or three other stones and birds in the tree. When I go after the one, but that's okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, or adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extorters, shall inherit the kingdom of God. He mentions it twice. Now this, this is a, how many know that the Apostle Paul understood our Hebrew roots? That's all in you, actually. And when you have something repeated, it is for emphasis. Twice in this verse, he said, if you do these things, you are not part of the kingdom. Of such were some of you, were some of you, were, past tense, some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, I want to read this and get a Jewish understanding of what the Apostle Paul was saying here. And I'm going to read this from the complete Jewish Bible. But do you not know that unrighteous people will have no share in the kingdom of God? That's what he's talking about inheriting. You see, Jesus died. We get His inheritance. It's not waiting for us to die. He died... Part of the new covenant is we get his inheritance. His inheritance is the kingdom. And now as the resurrected Lord, the resurrected king, and the high priest over the covenant, he's the administrator of his own inheritance that he makes available to us. So, do you not know that a righteous people will have no share in the kingdom of God? Don't delude yourselves. People who engage in sex before marriage, who share idols, who engage in sex after marriage with somebody other than their own spouse, who engage in active or passive homosexuality. Now I can stop there and say that the, in, in the King James it is effeminate and homosexual. You have to, and, 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 the, and both Thayer's and in Kittles, when you look at the Greek word effeminate, it can be translated male prostitute. When you understand Roman law, a male prostitute can only be passive in that relationship. Not active. So it's, it's contrasting both. But Dr. Stern brought in right and said he brought them in both together. That whether it's passive or active, it's forbidden. Then he goes on to say, Who steal, who are greedy, who are drunk, now wait for it who assault people with contemptuous language. 
there went millions of Facebook ministries. Right there, the Apostle Paul said, whatever you have, it isn't kingdom. Who rob? None of these will share in the kingdom of God. Some of you used to do these things. I like that past tense again. But you have cleansed yourself. You have been set apart of God, for God. And you have come to be counted righteous through the power of the Lord Yeshua the Messiah and the Spirit of our God. You see, if we're going to walk in kingdom in the last days, liberalism and the spirit of this world are lowering the standards. And they will march, they will protest, they will get violent. And this violence will continue until the Lord comes because the ultimate hissy fit is called the Valley of Armageddon. How many know when they come there, they're not there to blow Jesus' kisses as he returns on a white horse? They're there to protest and say that I refuse to bow to the Creator, that we have become gods ourselves. And we can determine what is right and what is wrong. They're, 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 they want to be Nietzsche's supermen, ubermensch, which there is neither right nor wrong for him, but what he declares he will do, that is law to him. That's the spirit of this thing. Now all this stuff will continue, and they're going to demand it because the flesh wants to drown out anything of our Judeo-Christian heritage. That's why they hate the Ten Commandments. That's why they hate the commandments of God. That's why they hate the Gospels. They will pervert it. They will pull out snippets here and there. They will, they will take Greek and Hebrew and they will turn it up sideways and they will lie about the root word definitions to get you to where they want you that is away from what God says. And it will continue. But in these last days, guys, we need to realize that as they are lowering the standards, heaven is raising the standards. You want to move in the power of God in the last days? You better have the character of Messiah burned into you. If he sees the fruit, he can release the gifts. In fact, the Apostle Paul contrasts the two. He said, if I have not love, and I speak in the tongues of men and angels, I'm just clanking brass. There's this untrue sound. He was sharing how that the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit bring balance and causes the gifts to give a true resonance that always points to Messiah and never to man. There was a scene in the book of Acts after they did a mighty healing, and, and the men run to them, and he says, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. You're acting like we're gods. Like we did this in our own power. We didn't. Uh-oh. We have been one that has been sent from the presence of another. We do it in the name of Jesus. We were sent by Him. We were commissioned by Him. We represent Him. That means we're to smell like Him. We're to walk like Him. We're to talk like Him. Oh no, you, you, still, you don't, still don't have it yet. We want this conduit of power to flow from here to here. But the only way that heaven will let it connect, it's got to be Jesus on this end and Jesus on this end. When you have it, the power flows. And the more this end becomes like Jesus, the greater the power can flow from this end. That's why the fruit are so important. That's why we've got to deal with the fruit. We've got to deal with motivational gifts of what motivated Messiah. And those gifts are manifested through us. They're, they're revealed in the book of Romans before we can ever get to the gifts. And then when we get the gifts and the motivation and the character in place, we can understand how to move in true authority because it will be, once you're a man under authority, you can move in delegated authority. We have too many rebels that want to move in kingdom authority and they will refuse to bow their knee to the throne of God. And anything that won't bow its knee to the throne of God is of the kingdom of darkness. 
Guys, we got to have a lot of changing. We got to have a lot of changing. We need to move from circus to remnant. And it's a state of heart, not a state of circumstance. In the new book that I'm writing, God gave me a prophetic word about the remnant. The remnant are those, regardless of their bondages, that have a heart to serve God freely. And if they're in bondage now, because of the attitude of their hearts, their hearts will walk them to freedom, to be that remnant that can serve Him in the days that we're living. That's where we're at. That's what God wants to do. And as we understand, and as we begin to seek to answer that heart cry of the Greeks. And whenever you, whenever you read in, in the New Testament, they're talking about Greeks, talking about pagans. We begin to hear the heart cry of the pagans that they would see Jesus. And we begin to answer that call to begin to dis demonstrate who Jesus is in our lives. We're going to see that last great revival. We're going to see that last great harvest because my desire is the lamb who was slain would receive the reward of his suffering, which is a great harvest of men set free and serving him. Now, Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus. Father, our heart's cry is to crucify the flesh. Our heart's cry is to not be like the world. It leads to destruction. It leads to heartache. It leads to deception. It leads, it leads to a life of, of, of being deluded and, to, and being deceived. But Father, our desire is to be part of those called out of Babylon. That we can serve you with our whole heart. That we can serve you in righteousness and in holiness. That we can see the name of Jesus honored by the way we conduct ourselves, by the way that we live. Our desire is not to take your name and make it vain, but to make it renowned in all the earth. And Father, begin moving on us. Give us the tools. Give us the anointing. Give us your grace to crucify what needs to be crucified so that we can have resurrected life that represents our Messiah in every single area of life. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name.